All right, we're live. <clears throat> Morton, if you would like to say a few words, please go ahead. So, um, first of all, um, yeah, I want to say thank you all for joining. Uh, and then I'm here ready to talk about the Exocellular Matrix Conference uh, next year in June, Copenhagen. Last time we were more than 400 participants from 40 different countries and 200 abstracts. It's not a Gordon conference and it's not a organ specific conference. It's really where you have the extracellular matrix meeting pharmacology. Because I have a deep belief that if we're going to change the life of patients, we actually need to change the matrix. And to me, that's uh, extracellular matrix pharmacology. I think it will be a smash at, as it was last time uh, with some of the best speakers in the world on matrix. Um, Geesley was giving a fantastic talk. This time we also have Detlef and um, Scott Friedman. There are many joining us. Uh, I think it will be really an exciting, uh, exciting event. And today, uh, as a chair of the Extracellular Matrix Pharmacology Conference, I'm happy that we have these symposiums. I think it's number five today. And it's really keeping us warm and discussing matrix because uh, matrix is important and collagen are important. Uh, so uh, so I, I really enjoy these sessions. And and thank you so much to uh, to Janet and to, to Geesley for, for um, in accepting the invitation and to give us an update on on their fields and matrix today and of course for Jenny uh, that's going to show you some some amazing data on how to modulate the matrix i hope it will be a fantastic evening or morning depending on where you are in the world and so we are back to you and thank you for allowing me to to introduce of course thank you morton great um so Thank you, Morten, and, and for these kind words with regards to the ECM Symposium. Um, my name is Mayur. I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining this uh, exciting webinar. Um, so I want to take a moment, as Morten already mentioned, to acknowledge the success of our previous webinars. In fact, this is our fifth webinar in the ECM Symposium series. Our previous topics highlight the relevance of uh, fibroblast activity in heart failure, we had a webinar on um, tumor fibrosis, on fibroinflammation in inflammatory bowel diseases, as well as the relevance of the ECM in tissue destruction diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. So if you're interested in, in receiving a recording of these previous sessions, then there should be a small pop-up right now where you can click on and we'll be happy to send you some more information. But today's focus will be uh, on the role of the ECM in lung fibrosis. And in a moment, Dr. Jeanette Burgess will introduce us to how the ECM is an active agent in lung fibrosis. Then Dr. Gisley Jenkins will discuss the role of the epithelium in pulmonary fibrosis. And finally, Dr. Yeni will share information on prognostic and pharmacodynamic biomarkers for ECM remodeling, immune cell activity, and endotyping in lung fibrosis. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to actively engage with us. So please feel free to use the private chat feature to ask your questions or share your thoughts. We'll be selecting some of the most uh, intriguing questions and addressing them during our uh, dedicated Q&A session uh, at the end of the webinar. So don't hesitate to participate and make the most out of this interactive session. So first, I would like to invite Professor Jeanne Burgers Ber uh, Dr. Burgess is a professor at the Exocellular Matrix uh, in Disease Pathogenesis at the University of Medical Center Groningen, with previous positions at the University of New South Wales and University of uh, Adelaide. Her research centers around understanding the role of the ECM in lung pathology, investigating changes in lung tissue and airway strictures during disease development. Her research bridges basic science with the practical goals of preventing and treating human lung diseases that affects millions of people worldwide. So now without further ado, I would like to hand over the virtual stage to Dr. Jeanette, and we look forward to your presentation. Okay. All right, and if you just use the arrow case, you should be able to move to the next slide. Thanks, Maya. So yeah, it's, it's my pleasure to talk about the role of the extracellular matrix in lung fibrosis as an active player in this process. Uh, these are my financial disclosures. 
So this image was painted by an artist who also had IPF. And she was tr trying to describe how she feels her lungs, with the darker areas being areas where she felt she couldn't get any oxygenation and the clearer, whiter areas being areas where she felt there was gas exchange. And this really represents to me the heterogeneity of this disease and the heterogeneity of the changes that we see in the extracellular matrix. So when we look at lung histological sections with the green here showing us collagen deposition, even in early stage fibrosis, we can clearly see that there are differences in that lung structure. And if we look closer, the macroscopic um, structure of the alveoli, what we're looking at here is a second harmonics generated image of collagen fibers around the alveolar wall. In the purple, we can see the autofluorescence, so cell structures, but in the orange and green, we're looking at collagen fibers that have different organizational structures. And we can see that these are interwoven and providing the structure that supports all of the cells that sit in our lung. So traditionally, we thought of this extracellular matrix as this structural support that gives a framework and a stability. But I think everybody here now recognizes that this is actually a bioactive entity and that there's communication between this matrix structure and the cells. And this is very important for regulating how cells respond. So how do we kind of think about this? What are the elements within this matrix that can talk to cells? So when we schematically represent it, we show big cables of collagen fibers. We show sort of elastic networks of our elastin fibers. And then there's proteoglycans that hold all of this together and matrikines. And then we have fibroblasts sitting within this structure, as well as other infiltrating cells, macrophages, or even resident macrophages. And this changes when we think about a fibrotic structure. We see more of the proteins. We see that the way that they're interlinked is different. And this really depicts what we can see when we look at structure of lung tissue. So why is this important? Because it's all of these changes that can talk to the cells. So we know that we see changes in composition or amount of matrix proteins in a fibrotic lung. We know that there's changes in the organization and the topography of these matrix fibers. And there's changes in the stiffness. And Yanni's going to tell us about altered release of bioactive matrix fragments that can also have a biological activity in this structure. So let's step through those one by one, starting with changing composition and amount. So many people have shown that there's changes in the amount of collagen, and that's very important for all of these uh, factors that we're looking at on this slide. But I'd like to also highlight that there's changes in some of the smaller matricine proteins that are very important for the, this assembly of these collagen fibers. So I'd like to tell you a story today about fibulin 1, which is a matricine that's important for collagen fibril formation. And fibulin 1 has four isoforms. And in particular, I'd like to highlight fibulin 1C. In humans, the A and B isoforms are expressed during development but not during adulthood. So it's the C and D isoforms that we see in adults. And in terms of fibroblast and mesenchymal cells, it's the C isoform that I find really exciting. Why do I find this exciting? We see more of this in our fibrotic airways and peripheral tissue. And we've seen, if we uh, look at this uh, by Western blots, we can also see this. And we see this either in lung lysates that come from explanted lungs so after a patient has had a transplant, but also we see this early during the disease process in diagnostic biopsies. And if we look at the relationship between the amount of fibulin 1 and some of the lung function uh, measurements that we can make, we can see that there is a relationship between the amount of fibulin 1 and the performance of the lung. And interestingly, we don't see these sorts of relationships with other important metrokines like periostin or fibronectin. So there's something particular about fibulin 1 and the way that it's enabling the collagen fibres to assemble that's related to lung function. Now we've used wound repair assays. So I don't know if you're familiar with these assays, but we take mesenchymal cells, in this case, human lung fibroblasts, and we culture them 
in a tissue culture flask. And once we have a confluent layer, and while those cells are growing to confluence, they deposit the extracellular matrix to make themselves comfortable. But we can then wound them, making a scratch in the middle of that layer, and we can watch over time as to how quickly they can refill that layer. So if we do such an assay, and in this case, we've actually performed the assay using airway smooth muscle cells, another member of the mesenchymal cell family. And these particular studies were done in the context of asthma, where we also see fibulin 1 changes because of the remodeling and the collagen changes in the, the airways. So here I'm showing you in the dark blue line, non-asthmatic airway smooth muscle cells that was placed on top of a bed of matrix deposited by asthmatic cells. And then we looked at how long they took to close that wound. And we've looked at this over a three day time period. If we compare that to the asthmatic airway smooth muscle cells, we can see that that particular cell type closed the wound area much more rapidly. Now, if we then change the matrix that those cells are deposited on top of to enable them to close that wounded area to an, a matrix that doesn't contain fibulin 1, so as the cells were depositing matrix, we prevented them from producing fibulin 1 using an oligosense nucleotide. Um, we see that in both cases, the rate of wound closure is reduced. And intriguingly, the asthmatic or diseased mesenchymal cell comes back to the level of the non-diseased. So by changing the presence of fibulin 1, which we assume changes the collagen fiber structure, we change how these cells respond and how quickly they can fill that wounded area. If we look at then in a mouse model, and these studies were performed in collaboration with uh, Professor Phil Hansborough in Australia, we see in the diamonds, animals that were treated with TGF-beta as a prefibrotic stimulus, but also had an antisense fibulin 1. So they don't, they're not able to produce fibulin 1. And you, if you compare the triangles with the diamonds, you see that there's a reduction in the sensitivity of the airway. So TGF-beta increases the airway resistance, but the absence of fibulin 1 reduces that. So there's a functional impact of the collagen structure on airway resistance. If we then look at the amount of fibulin 1 that we can see in serum, from patients with fibrotic lung diseases. And across the x-axis, you're looking at different groups of patients with on the left, we have healthy controls, all the way through to IPF patients with the greatest degree of fibrosis on the right. And we can see that there's an increase in the amount of fibulin 1. This is a soluble factor that we are measuring in the serum of these patients, indicating that this uh, matricine is also being released and having a soluble presence potentially also impacting uh, the biological activity in these patients. And once again, if we stratify those IPF patients and we look at uh, their fibulin 1 levels with, in this case, the blue line being those who have low, and this is an arbitrary value that we've applied to our cohort with 50% being the arbitrary value. So those below that value, uh, we consider to have low fibulin and those above that value had high fibulin, we see that those who had low fibulin at the time of uh, blood collection had a worse clinical prognosis going forward over time. So how is this fibulin 1 working? Well, if we go back into our animal model and we look at the lung tissue, on the left-hand side, we can see our controls, and on the right-hand side, we see animals that were exposed to bleomycin, with the top panel being wild-type animals, and the bottom panels being animals that lack fibulin 1C. And we can see in the pink that the collagen deposition induced by bleomycin exposure is occurring in the wild-type animals. But in those animals that lack fibulin 1C, we're not seeing this deposition of the collagen fibres. And if we quantify this, we can see this clearly in the numbers, that there isn't an increase in the amount of collagen in the bleomycin animals without fibulin 1C. So what is going on here? 
I realise there's a lot of data on this slide, so I'll just walk you through it quickly. So in panel A, we're looking at uh, the production of TGF beta at the gene level in our wild type animals with and without bleomycin and our Fibulin 1C animals. And I hope you agree with me that there really isn't a difference there. We're seeing induction of TGF beta mRNA. But in panel B, we do see a difference. And what we're looking at in that panel is the activity of TGF beta. So we know that TGF beta is released from a cell in an inactive form, bound to latent TGF beta binding proteins, which is then anchored into the extracellular matrix and needs to be released from that matrix to be activated. So we see here that in the animals that lack fibulin 1C, in the presence of bleomycin, there's no induction of TGF beta activity. And if we look in panels C, we see that this is also related to a reduction in the amount of latent TGF beta binding protein 1. In panel E, we can see that from immunoprecipitation experiments, the latent TGF beta binding protein 1 needs to bind to fibulin 1C. So when fibulin 1C is not present, we don't see uh, TGF beta anchored in the extracellular matrix because we don't see that interrelationship with the latent TGF beta binding protein. And in panel D, we verify that uh, looking further at TGF beta activity. So we're seeing there's interrelationships between these proteins that are very important for collagen for fibre formation but they're also regulating other processes that contribute to the fibrotic uh, cycle within the lung tissue. So here I'm showing you in the top panel control airways and followed by IPF airways and then control parenchymal tissue and IPF tissue in the magenta or pink, you can see fibulin 1 um, detection. In the green or cyan, it's the LTBP1 interrelationship. And I'm introducing another player here, osteoprotegrin, which is another player that we're interested in that we also see increased in uh, the IPF tissue. And I hope you'll watch this space as we develop that story further, because you, you'll see in the merged images that these three proteins are coming together. And we believe that they're very important in regulating the fibrotic process. So, that's about the changes in the composition of the matrix. I started out by talking to you that there are also changes in organisation and topography. So what does that mean? Here we can see again second harmonics imaging of non-diseased and fibrotic uh, peripheral tissue. We can see, I hope you agree, more organised collagen in the pink and also more yellow signal for the disorganized collagen. So overall, there's more collagen, but the organization of this structure is very different in the fibrotic tissue. And when we quantify that, we see there's an increase in the ratio of this forward to backward, which is representing the organized to disorganized collagen. So either we have an increase in the amount of organized collagen or a reduction in the amount of disorganized collagen to give us this disbalance in this ratio which all talks to different structural arrangement of the collagen fibres, which then will influence how the fibroblasts and other cells in that environment will respond. We see that there's more denatured collagen here using a peptide, a fluorescently labelled peptide that binds to uh, disorganised collagen where the triple helices has been disrupted. And we're seeing more of this present in the IPF tissue compared to the control. And if we look at these environments using uh, SEM, scanning electron microscopy, we again see that the topography that's present within these tissue structures is very different in our fibrotic environment. And I also touched on stiffness of the matrix. So the mechanical properties um, are also important for how cells respond. And we know from work from uh, Eric White's team and also from others that the tissue um, either as native lung tissue or if you decellarize that tissue remove all of the cell components and retain the extracellular matrix when we look at the IPF tissue there is an enhancement in the stiffness here measured as Young's modulus so this fibrotic extracellular matrix has become a stiffer environment in which the cells are residing 
So to try and understand this impact of changes in the structure and the stiffness, mechanical properties, we've turned to generating three-dimensional models um, from lung matrix. So we can take lung tissue, we decellularize it, and we're, from that we can make a powder, which we can then solubilize and make a hydrogel, which we can seed cells on top of or inside of to uh, try and understand how these changes in properties influence cell behaviors. So when we think about the mechanics of the lung, we, there are two properties that we think about. The first is the elasticity, which is the resistance to deformation. So if we poke something, how much does it deform to try and uh, dissipate the force? And that you can think about in terms of an elastic band. If you stretch an elastic band, it deforms in uh, response to the force that you're applying. But as soon as you remove that force, it snaps back to its original form. And that we talk about as elastic modulus or stiffness. But because our organs and hydrogels uh, have a large component of water, we also think about the viscosity of these structures. So viscosity is the ability of a material to dissipate energy. So if you think about if you put poke your finger into a glass of water, the water molecules immediately move away to dissipate the force that your finger is applying to them. So because our organs and also the hydrogels that we're using to represent them have both of these components, we talk about the viscoelasticity. And in terms of mechanical terms, we talk about stress relaxation in terms of how quickly does the material change to dissipate the energy. So you can see on the graph on the right that a liquid instantaneously dissipates. So the force is uh, relaxed immediately, whereas a solid, a completely solid material does not dissipate force at all. So it doesn't relax, whereas our organs and our hydrogels follow a curve. And we can understand the dynamics of the material um, by understanding the, the structure of that curve. So. When we look at the stiffness of our hydrogels, we have seen that if we compare the tissue that we uh, derive the extracellular matrix from to generate the hydrogel with the hydrogel, we see very similar patterns of uh, stiffness. The magnitude of stiffness is uh, reduced somewhat, and we think this reflects the absence of cells in our hydrogel materials because they're, of course, still present. But intriguingly, when we generate hydrogels from fibrotic extracellular matrix, we still see that enhanced stiffness in these hydrogels. So to try and understand, is it the composition or is it the stiffness um, that's contributing to cellular responses, we've chosen to take the hydrogels and try and apply the same stiffness that's present in a fibrotic hydrogel to that matrix derived from a healthy lung. And to do this, we thought about different ways of cross-linking the hydrogel because the uncrossed hydrogel is quite soft um, and is able to relax a lot. When we cross-link, we can increase the stiffness and therefore this material is not able to uh, move as much so it doesn't relax as much. And to do this, we've used ruthenium, which is a chemical cross-linking that um, happens in the presence of an activator and cross-links tyrosines in the presence of UV light. So we've used control ECM hydrogels and cross-linked them with ruthenium so that we have hydrogels that have the same ECM components, but altered stiffness. And if we create these gels, these are the types of images that we can look at. Um, and we see that the degree of um, high density matrix, so the closer together matrix fibers, uh, is enhanced when we cross-link the hydrogels. So if we then characterize that, we can show uh, in numbers that indeed cross-linking increases the amount of high density matrix, but it also has a change in the way that the fibers are aligned and we actually see a reduction in the alignment of the fibers in these hydrogels. We see that fibroblasts when seeded on top of these hydrogels are viable in both the soft and the stiffer matrix and if we then look to see if we see classic um, 
differentiation of fibroblasts to myofibroblasts, we do in fact see that on top of these stiffer hydrogels um, as characterized by the amount of alpha smooth muscle actin detectable. We can also see that the gene um, expression and activation as measured by the nuclear area or the circularity of the nuclei in these fibroblasts is altered. And this is enhanced on the stiffer hydrogels. But that doesn't tell us completely about what is happening in a fibrotic hydrogel, because a fibrotic hydrogel is not only stiffer, but has a different extracellular matrix composition as well. So to try and understand those questions, we've taken our hydrogels, so native from non-diseased lungs and from fibrotic lungs. And then we've taken primary lung fibroblasts from both of those sources and crossed them over. So we have non-diseased fibroblasts in non-diseased hydrogels, fibrotic in fibrotic, but also the crossover of non-diseased in fibrotic and fibrotic fibroblast in non-diseased gels. And we've characterized these. So we started out by looking to see how much collagen could we see deposited by the cells over a seven or 14 day period. And I'm showing you data here from 14 days. So these graphs are a little bit complicated and they're going to be the same on the next few slides. So I'll just step you through them. What we're seeing on the dotted line in the middle of each of the graphs is the comparison of an empty hydrogel from a non-diseased compared to a fibrotic. So that's the intrinsic difference that's present in the matrix. In the light blue bar, we're seeing the response of the non-fibrotic fibroblasts. And in the dark blue bar, the response of the fibrotic fibroblasts. So if the light blue or dark blue bar is over, is above or below, the dotted line but not crossing it, then the response of those fibroblasts was different in the fibrotic compared to the non-fibrotic gel over and above differences that are present in the gel anyway. But what we see on this slide is that there's no differences anywhere. And this is where we were trying to look at the amount of total collagen that we could detect in the gels. But these gels are predominantly made of collagen. So this is telling us that the cells are not adding more collagen or degrading the collagen to a significant effect or a significant degree. But if we then look at how the fibers in these hydrogels are arranged, we see that here we're looking at the amount of um, high density matrix. So how closely packed are those fibers? On the se day seven, the non-fibrotic fibroblasts have made much more high density matrix in the fibrotic gel than the non-fibrotic gel. But the fibrotic fibroblasts didn't change anything. And by day 14, both fibroblasts have reduced the amount of high density matrix that's present in the gels. If we look at alignment, we see a different story that the fibrotic fibroblasts have aligned many more fibers. And we're looking at collagen fibers here within the fibrotic gel compared to the non-fibrotic gel. But the non-fibrotic fibroblasts did not alter this. And this pattern is seen at both day seven and day 14. So the fibrotic fibroblasts have a desire to have the collagen fibers aligned within their vicinity. And if we look at the mechanical properties, we see that the non-fibrotic fibroblasts have enhanced the stiffness of the fibrotic gel. The fibrotic fibroblasts have also done this, but not to quite the same extent. Um, and on the right hand side, we're looking at the relaxation of these gels. And we see that there's no difference between the two fibroblasts in the way that they've done that. Um, but the non-fibrotic fibroblasts have uh, made the fibrotic gel relax just a little bit more than the non-fibrotic gel. So these cells are responding to the environment that they're encountering. Um, but they do it in a different way, depending on the origin of the cells. So the fibrotic environment is speaking to these cells and influencing how they're responding. So I hope that I've been able to show you that changes in the composition, organization, topography and stiffness of this matrix that is dictated by the collagen fibers and the matrix ions that help organize this structure are very important for driving fibrotic cell processes. I touched very briefly on release of bioactive ECM fragments because we measured fibulin 1 in serum, but I know that Yanni is going to tell us a whole lot more about the importance of considering this element of the extracellular matrix. So 
my take home messages are to you that the ECM really drives cell responses and that this altered ECM in lung diseases potentially is impeding regenerative processes and definitely needs to be a target when we think about therapeutics and that 3D models are very important as we advance our knowledge in this area. In closing, I need to acknowledge the patients worldwide who allow us the privilege of working with their materials, the fantastic teams that I have the privilege, privilege of collaborating with, and the team that I get to work with every day. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for your fascinating talk. Um, all right, so for everyone that joined a few minutes later, please put any questions or comments you have for Jeanette or the upcoming speakers in the chat, and we will make sure to take the questions at the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Great, thank you, Jeanette. All right, then let us switch to Professor Geesley Jenkins. Um, Dr. Geesley is an NA NIHR research professor and serves as the head of the Margaret Turner Warwick Center for Fibrosis and Lung Diseases and uh, National Heart and Lung Institute. His primary research focuses on interstitial lung diseases with a particular emphasis on pulmonary fibrosis. Professor Jenkins and his team strive to comprehend the biological foundations of pulmonary fibrosis and aim to translate this understanding into improved outcomes for patients. He is also the principal uh, investigator on several uh, longitudinal studies, also some of which Nordic has been working with. And over the past few years, he has received several uh, awards and medals for respir from respiratory and inter interstitial lung disease societies for his work. So we're really excited to hear your talk. Um, so the stage is yours. Thank you. So if uh, I could have my slides, that would be great. Yeah, you should be able to use the uh, arrow keys to... Uh, okay, there we go. Perfect. Okay. So uh, thank you uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, and I'm going to talk about something a little bit different about the role of the alveolar epithelium in generating the fibrotic matrix that we just heard about. So these are my disclosures. This is uh, the Margaret Turner Warwick Center for Fibrosing Lung Disease. So my lab uh, are based, uh, are, are listed on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, and this is where I work. And this is a collaboration between the Royal Brompton Hospital and Imperial College, uh, and we have one simple aim, and that's to try and cure IPF. So idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a is not a rare condition, it's a becoming more common condition with a two to three year history of progressive shortness of breath and exertion and a dry non productive cough. It characteristically affects males more than females. Um, people are often ex smokers or have worked or have an association with building and manual trades. Family history is important, and I'm going to talk a bit about the genetics of IPF today. I'm not going to go into it in too much detail, but genetics are emerging as a major risk factor. It's also associated with increasing age, as I said, male sex and comorbidities, including hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and ischemic heart disease. And this is really important when we consider other sources of matrix. I go into this, but the endothelium is emerging as a, as a prime candidate. IPF is a progressive disease, as this CT shows here, the, the scarring that you see on the left-hand panels in patients who had a single lung transplant and this is their native lung. And as you can see, the white stuff, which is the scar, gets progressively worse over time. And without, uh, without their transplant, these patients would have unfortunately died. And you can see this from our unpublished data in the profile study, that the median survival of patients with IPF is 1,284 days, which is a little over three years. But it's not just about mortality from diagnosis to unfortunately the end of life is a journey of progressive breathlessness and exertion, uh, increasing disability and increasing requirement of things like uh, oxygen and uh, walking and moving aids. And when we think about IPF in comparison with cancers, you can see that IPF has a pretty poor prognosis with the 25% five-year survival rate which makes it worse than most cancers. It's 
only beaten by lung and pancreas, which are truly awful with their prognosis. And IPF has about the same uh, prognosis as esophageal and gastric cancer. But this is normal lung. It's a beautiful structure. I think it's the most beautiful organ in the in the human body. It's very delicate, and this fine lattice work structure shows the normal alveolus. The blue, light blue matrix is the interstitial matrix surrounding the capillary, and you can see the alveolar capillary unit there. And it looks a bit like a bath sponge, and actually it feels a bit like a bath sponge. If you if you're dealing with it as an expert, you can squish it up quite nicely. Uh, and it is about two microns uh, across from the alveolar lumen to the endothelial lumen, and that allows the transfer of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And by comparison, you can see the shaft of a hair follicle or a fine grain of sand on one of the, uh, yeah, not Brighton Beach, they're big rocks on Brighton Beach, but uh, on small grains of sand, somewhere beautiful like uh, San Francisco. Uh, but the surface area is huge. If you were to unfurl the lung, it would have the surface area of a tennis court. So it's thin, but extremely uh, has an extremely big surface area, which makes it very delicate. Uh, and it's but it's robust. It has robust defense systems. But unfortunately, these, these defense systems can be challenged by exposure to things like uh, parrot antigens. Asbestos, this picture was taken from, uh, from Western Australia. Uh, mold, drugs such as nitrofurin toin, cigarette smoke, or autoimmune disease. And this is a picture of Raynaud's phenomenon. So all of these things are associated with injuring the lung. And when that happens, oh, and of course, viruses uh, such as COVID. Uh, and when this happens, you get a fibrotic lung, uh, which looks like this, which is a Thick and you can see clearly the fine latticework structure is destroyed. You have this fibrinectin rich matrix. Uh, and when you when you take explanted fibrotic lung out, it literally does feel like a brick. You could build houses with this stuff. It's, I mean, and it's really quite astonishing. Uh, and this is what it looks like uh, at the cellular level. So you have uh, bronchialization. We used to call it bronchialization. It's, uh, it's transition from AT two to 81 cells, they get stuck in transition, so they look like they're bronchialized, but they're a transitional aberrant uh, epithelial cell. You get disruption of the basement membrane, which is crucial because that allows interaction between epithelium and cells that epithelium would normally not be in contact with, particularly fibroblasts and myofibroblasts. You get uh, inflammation in the lumen, uh, which may be promoted by uh, the apoptotic epithelium, uh, and also you get disruption of the endothelial barrier, so you get influx of circulatory cells and molecules to the interstitial space. And this is essentially what you see in fibrosis. So how does this happen? Well, what I've been working on for a number of years is a pathway by which injury to the epithelium leads to intracellular signaling through the cytoskeleton to the alpha V beta 6 integrin, but also the alpha V beta 1 integrin in the fibroblasts. Uh, and this leads to activation of TGF beta. And, uh, and Janet described how fibrillin 1 can activate TGF beta, and this or can help be co activate TGF beta. It's a very sensitive and exquisitely, exquisitely regulated uh, process. Uh, and, and the key process in the lung is by the alpha V beta 6 integrin. And this activates TGF beta, and TGF beta is a very pro fibrotic molecule. Uh, and my group over the years has, has identified the intracellular signaling pathway, which leads to the activation of uh, alpha VB to 6 mediated TGF beta activation. It goes through the cell surface receptor, LPA2, PAR1, sphinx 1 phosphate, a whole bunch of GPCRs by a GFQ11 signaling pathway. And this is amplified by a molecule which I'll talk more about called ACAP13 which activates rho, rho kinase, and this literally pulls on the cytoplasmic domain of the alpha e beta 6 integrin to activate TGF beta. And we know that IPF is caused by alveolar injury because the stuff that you breathe in is, is, the, first, is the first hit, but you require this to happen in a genetically susceptible host. And 
you can have rare variants with high effect size of surfactant protein C, surfactant protein A, and telomerase complex genes. And where you have mutations or, or highly pathogenic mutations in these, in these proteins, you don't need much injury. In, and actually they're rare variants, so they don't occur frequently, uh, but they, you, you're gonna get you're gonna get fibrosis pretty much irrespective of what you breathe in. More commonly, however, we see variants in common common variants, uh, most notably the MUC5B minor allele, which increases the risk of pulmonary fibrosis fivefold for each copy of the the minor allele you have. And this requires you to breathe in some some abnormal injurious agent and then you get fibrosis because clearly we're all exposed to the same air but we don't all get fibrosis and we in collaboration with louise wayne and richard allen and the genetic epidemiology group in leicester have identified a number of different uh, variants now We've, we're up to 19 causal variants none of which are as dramatic as muc 5 b but together they uh, combined to cause a number of problems. And I'm going to focus uh, the rest of the talk describing the work that we're doing on ACAP13, which as you saw from my cartoon, is a key amplification pathway. And indeed, it was so exciting when I found out about ACAP13 as a as one of the disease ca causing variants. I went home and told my kids who were nonplussed because they were I think they're both still at school at the time and didn't quite understand why genetics or science was of any interest. And we did EQTL analysis uh, of that variant with lung tissue and, and showed that the, the sentinel variant for, that we had observed in the GWAS was associated with uh, increased expression of ACAP13 in lung tissue. And indeed, as you can see here, from three cohorts of normal lung tissue, uh, the minor allele is the A allele. And with each uh, A allele, you get a dose-dependent increase in ACAP13 expression in lung tissue. Uh, you don't see the same effect in blood, and this is a, an important thing about GYC. You know, these are these are global mutations, and they can have different effects in different tissues. So you really have to assess in the tissue of interest. And when we looked in normal lung and fibrotic lung by immunohistochemistry, you could see that ACAP13 is expressed in bronchial epithelium in the lumen of of the um of the of the airway here and then in type one and type two epithelium in normal fibro in normal lung in fibrotic lung you can see very nicely that the staining is in the epithelium particularly that overlying fibroblastic foci as shown in the arrow in panel e we also see a lot of acat 13 in these lymphoid follicles we have no idea what it does but it was quite consistent so what is ACAP13? So I'm going to describe work done by Louise Organ, who is now back in Australia, uh, and Kevin bin Louis, who is a postdoc in my lab at the current time. So ACAP13 is a huge scaffold protein. It, uh, it's 300 kilodaltons, give or take. Uh, and it is primarily known to mediate rho A activation, but it also recruits PKA. So it recruits both rho A and PKA, and the PKA recruitment counteracts rho A activation to maintain homeostatic function. Um, and so if you disrupt either, if you amplify this or you reduce PKA, you disrupt the balance. <clears throat> and if you disrupt the balance, you can get increased rho, activation, rho A activation, which we would anticipate, we would predict with increased TGF beta activation, which would be more profibrotic. And you'd get a whole bunch of profibrotic cellular events leading to uh, due to increased TGF beta activation. Furthermore, because you increase phosphodiesterase E4 recruitment, this inhibits cyclic AMP, inhibits the PKA function, which in turn further amplifies Rho signaling. And you may be aware that the latest Boehringer uh, drug that is uh, targeting PD4. Uh, may impact this system. So understanding how ACAP13 is important and how this uh, mutation that we've identified affects fibrosis is important because we can take different ways to try and inhibit this through inhibitors, sRNA or CRISPR. And I'm going to show you some of our 
uh, more recent unpublished work looking at these, uh, the, the, these strategies. So this is work done by Louise Organ. She stimulated uh, cells with LPA and measured rho A activation and used the uh, imaginatively uh, named A13 inhibitor of ACAP13 to try and block this. And as you can see, you, she got a very nice increase in rho A activity as measured by GLISA, which was inhibited in a dose-dependent way by increased A13. Furthermore, using uh, SMAD2 phosphorylation as a readout of TJP activity, she was able to demonstrate, as we've seen before, that LPA activates uh, PSMAD2. Uh, and this is just the quantification of her three Western blots over here. And this was inhibited uh, by the, the 10 micromolar concentration of A13. Kevin took over this work and developed an sRNA to A. CAP13, uh, and you can see from the Western blot on this RT-PCR that he could effectively inhibit uh, ACAP13, and this led to a reduction uh, in LPA-induced, uh, sorry, in, in, it's increased endothelial permeability um, when stimulated with uh, LPA in the presence of SI ACAP13. He also developed an expression plasmid to overexpress ACAP13, uh, and you can see that uh, is very nicely demonstrated here. Finally, uh, most ambitiously, he set about developing a CRISPR model, uh, and he targeted ACAP13 in two ways. He targeted exome 5 to knock out ACAP13, and he also developed a single nucleotide substitution to create the A allele, the A variant. So by CRISPRing uh, at exactly RS6202-5270, he was able to mutate the G to the A variant to actually to see what happens to ACAP13 when the variant is induced. Uh, and what you can see is if you knock out ACAP13 in cells, you get a reduction uh, in ACAP13 protein, which is good. And you can see this Western blot and by immunocytochemistry. Interestingly, when you mutate in ACAP13, or the, the, the mutant variant that we see in patients with IPF, you don't get a, a change in the full length ACAP13, but you do get a big increase in the isoforms uh, shown here, which, are, which are, have their row A activation amplified uh, and their PD4 inhibition uh, activation amplified. And what you get is seen here an increase in these isoforms by immunocytochemistry. So, as you can see, these mutants uh, are known to uh, exist and they have uh, amplified uh, GEF, uh, rho GEF functions, but they lose their PKA, uh, their, their, their regulatory function. So what happens is when you, when, you, uh, when you measure their cyclic AMP activity, which is downstream of the PKA PD4 pathway, you see that if you knock out uh, ACAT13, you get increased cyclic AMP activity, which is good in, in fibrosis. We've known that for many years. But with the ACAT13 mutant that we see in patients with IPF, you reduce cyclic AMP. Activity, suggesting that loss of this PKA domain is absolutely crucial. And the work that we have funded through an MRC program grant in collaboration with Nordic Biosciences is to look at a whole range of different variants that we've identified in collaboration with Louise and Richard. I've just focused on ACAP13 because that's the where we've got made the most advances recently. But you can see that there's a bunch of different genes that we're interested in, including FAM13A, Desmoplakin, and we'd all still like to understand how MUC5B increases the risk of, uh, of pulmonary fibrosis. But this is one of the strategies that we're going to adopt to assess that. Finally, I'm going to talk briefly about distinct endotypes, and this is work done by Helen Feinberg using data from the profile study and measuring a whole bunch of different uh, biomarkers 
including uh, a Nordic panel and an epithelial biomarker panel. And you can see just by looking at this heat map, there are clearly different types of patients. Uh, and he identified three broad clusters, uh, one with a cluster of collagen 28 and pro-collagen 4, representing basement membrane. This fascinating cluster of cross-link fibrinogen, which is very unique and very strong in comparison to all the other clusters. And then this is a cluster showing, I apologize for the size of, uh, of, of, the, of the legends here, but these have got uh, SPD, MMP7, CA199, and CA125, so an epithelial damage cluster. And the bottom line is that they behave differently in those patients with uh, evidence of epithelial damage, with much worse prognosis compared to those with cross-link fibrinogen uh, or, or basement membrane abnormalities. So I'm going to finish there and just say that IPF is a progressive fibrotic lung disease characterized by epithelial injury in genetically susceptible individuals. That integrin-mediated TGFB activation is a central fibrogenic pathway with multiple molecular targets. And ACAP13 may be a master regulator of a number of important fibrogenic pathways which all lead in to TGFB activation. And finally, epithelial injury, particularly with failure to constitute the epithelial basement membrane, leads to a more aggressive lung fibrosis. Uh, finally, I'd just like to thank who actually did the work. This is my group. Uh, and uh, Hanan and, and Kevin did most of the studies that I described. And this is a picture of Copenhagen on Midsummer's Night. And I strongly urge you all to attend because it's a lot of fun and how they set fires in the middle of the uh, water there, but they manage it. Uh, so thank you, uh, and I look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Geasley, for your presentation. So as previously, please drop your questions for Dr. Geasley in the private chat, and then we'll make sure to uh, address them during the Q&A part of the webinar. Great. Then I would like to introduce you to uh, Dr. Yeni Sen. Yeni is uh, the head of respiratory research at Nordic Bioscience. And for the past 13 years, Yeni and her team have been focusing on developing uh, non-invasive tools uh, for specific lung disease processes. And this is done to aim uh, to enhance the understanding of pathologies and therapeutic effects. So in this time at Nordic, she's authored over 50 articles, abstracts, and, and book chapters as well. Um, the work spans both preclinical and clinical research. Uh, and so the team has in, uh, identified uh, prognostic and pharmacodynamic biomarkers uh, that explore the identification of novel end, uh, endotypes in chronic lung diseases. And Yeni will, uh, of course, discuss more about that right now. So the floor is yours, Yeni. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Mayor. So I will, of course, be talking about uh, biomarkers today. I will focus on fragments coming from the lungs, fragments that are related to immune cell activity. And I will also touch a bit about uh, on pun uh, endotyping. Um, I will mainly talk about pulmonary fibrosis today, but I just brought a few uh, uh, graphs, of a bit of data from, from the COPD field as well, which we also work in. Um, so we already had some really nice introduction to, to the extracellular matrix and what happens in the lung tissue when patients get pulmonary fibrosis. So I won't really go into detail uh, with this figure. This is a very simple illustration showing how much the tissue actually change in, in the fibrotic lung, both uh, re regarding the epithelial layer, basement membrane, interstitial matrix, and the immune cells coming in. And we know that all of these different um, processes release fragments from the tissue that we then can measure as biomarkers in the blood. So at Nordic, we uh, developed the, the Nordic protein fingerprint technology, which basically means that we are targeting very specific fragments of these proteins of interest. So instead of just measuring type 3 collagen, for example, as shown here, we measure specific uh, epitopes or neoepitopes in this collagen. So we do this because it gives us additional information. Um, we don't just get a measure of the full length protein, we get information on the formation of the collagen, the degradation of the collagen, or maybe even collagen resolution or fibrosis resolution. 
And we do this in, in different kinds of settings, different uh, processes um, to try and understand the disease better. So in, in, in this context today for pulmonary fibrosis and also COPD, we focus especially on these four different processes that are very relevant for, for disease. So fibrosis, um, of course, for pulmonary fibrosis, inflammation, epithelial damage and thrombosis. So I will mainly be talking about fibrosis and inflammation today because you just heard a really nice talk about the epithelial damage, going much more into detail about that. So I will start out with discussing some of the pro prognostic um, capabilities of these fragments. Um, and I will start with this uh, study that was actually some of the really the basis of what we have been doing in IPF at Nordic. So these data are coming out of the, the profile cohort. So with our um, very nice collaboration with Gisli Jenkins and his group, Toby Mayer and uh, GSK. So I think we are really the first ones to show that collagen formation measured in the blood is actually elevated in IPF patients. So these two graphs here show type 3 and type 6 collagen formation. Um, the dotted line shows the healthy reference range. So you can appreciate that the levels of collagen formation is elevated in IPF patients. And then when we divide the patients into progressors and non-progressors, we also see significant differences um, between these. So collagen formation is significantly more elevated in the patients that have progressive disease. This is true already at the early time point at diagnosis, but also when we follow the patients for, um, in this case, one year. In this study, we also look at collagen degradation. So this is not as intuitive that the collagen degradation is, is elevated in the fibrotic um, patients. But this is actually what we see. The progressive patients have highly elevated collagen degradation. So in addition to the... Um, elevated formation, they also have elevated degradation. So it's the whole remodeling, the turnover of the tissue that's um, enhanced in these patients. And this is actually a quite unique feature. Um, some of the other diseases that we are investigating at Nordic don't show this. They may only be uh, showing elevated formation, um, collagen formation. But in this case, it's really the remodeling, so the turnover of the lung tissue that's um, elevated. In this study, one of the newer markers that we looked into is the, the PROC4 that uh, Giesli also mentioned. So this is measuring uh, type 4 collagen, so basement membrane repair. Um, and we see that this is actually also elevated in the progressive IPF patients. So in combination with the epithelial damage, they also have changes to the basement membrane repair um, that we can see here in this graph to the left, and this is more elevated in the progressive patients. We've also worked with a, a Danish cohort of, of IPF patients called the PF Bio, um, and here we see very similar things that these kind of biomarkers are elevated in the progressive patients. Um, the graph here on the right side is, is coming out of that study, and this is really showing that the mortality is also um, associated with these uh, changes to the matrix. So here it's higher levels of the pro 4 so the basement membrane biomarker, that's related to a worse uh, survival. So in addition to looking at these fragments just at one time point and seeing how they differ between the different kinds of patients, We've also looked at how the rate of change um, happens. So this is from the, the original publication uh, with Giesli as the first author, where they looked at the rate of change in, in these different uh, processes. So they really showed that it's not just about measuring the these markers at one time point, but looking at how it changes over time. So if a patient is increasing, um, in levels of this, these remodeling fragments, then they're actually doing worse. So the graphs here are showing the hazard ratios for, for mortality and showing that if you are increasing your levels over uh, a three months period, then you're doing worse, you have a higher risk of mortality. And this was true both for the collagen biomarkers and also for the CRPM uh, biomarker, which is a, an inflammation uh, marker. We very recently uh, looked at this in another study as well with uh, a collaborator from um, Anche Prasse's uh, group. 
Um, here we also looked at the collagen remodeling markers and the CRPM, inflammation biomarker, and see a very similar picture that the patients that have increasing um, biomarker levels, the ones here shown in red, they're doing worse, they have a lower uh, survival. So now I'll shift gear uh, just a little bit to talk uh, a bit about some of the more specific biomarkers that we have and some that are more related to the inflammation uh, rather than the, the fibrosis itself. So I wanted to talk about this particular biomarker of Vimentin um, because this is a, a very good and clear case of showing how the epitope really matters. So we developed two different biomarkers for Vimentin. One that is targeting an MMP-degraded fragment, and another that's targeting the same fragment, MMP-degraded, but this also incorporated a citrullination. And what does, does this mean? It really means that the biomarker with the citrullination, the Vicam biomarker, is actually um, associated with macrophage activity. So this is a huge difference. They are very, very similar uh, markers, but they reflect different processes um, in the body. So we evaluated these two markers in the PFBio IPF cohort. And as you can see here, we saw um, very different pictures when we looked at the two. We divided the patients into progressive and stable. So the progressors are shown here in blue. On the left side, you see the Vicam marker, the macrophage activity marker. And we see that this is elevated in patients with progressive disease. When we look at the Vimentin biomarker without the citrullination, we don't see this. So this is, um, this is not showing any difference between the groups. And this is a clear um, study showing that the epitope really matters. It's not enough to measure Vimentin. We really need to, to add this extra layer um, to know what we're measuring and get a, a biomarker that's really relevant um, for disease. Another one of our um, interesting markers that are, are really relevant for lung is DL3. So this marker is related to neutrophils. It's targeting a fragment of elastin, which is a very important protein for the lungs. And this fragment is released by proteinase 3, which is generated by the active neutrophils. So this is really a marker of neutrophil activity in the lungs, but it's not measuring the um, the neutrophils itself is measuring a fragment of elastin. So we did a simple evaluation of, of this marker looking at the serum levels in healthy subjects in progressive pulmonary fibrosis patients and in CPD. And we see that these L3 levels are elevated both in the pulmonary fibrosis and CPD. A few years ago, um, Sarah from our group did this um, very interesting study looking at different fragments of elastin. So we made a whole panel of, of elastin fragment biomarkers. Um, so the difference between all of these is really the protease that releases the fragment. And we see that this actually makes a huge difference. So these data here comes out of the Eclipse cohort. It's a COPD study um, where we looked at the mortality risk uh, related that to the baseline levels of these biomarkers. And when we measured these five different markers of elastin, we saw that it was actually only two of these epitopes that were related to mortality risk. And, and of these, it was the L3 that was performing best with the highest hazard ratio. Then I'll move on to talk a bit about the pharmacodynamic uh, effects of these fragments. Um, and I'll start with some of the, the very early data that we had um, in a collaboration with, with GSK. We looked at this mTOR PI3 kinase inhibitor. This was evaluated in a small phase one study in, with IPF patients. So they were treated for up to 10 days um, with this compound. And within this very short time frame, we see um, significant reductions in collagen formation, showing that this is really potent in, in stopping the fibrogenesis in these patients. We went on actually and evaluated this compound also in different preclinical uh, model systems. Um, so this data here is shown on the left is from the SCAR in a jar assay. This is a fibroblast model. Um, data on the right is from the precision cut lung slice model using fibrotic uh, human lung tissue. And when we evaluated this compound in these two 
different settings and then measure the ProC6 biomarker of type 6 collagen formation, we see very similar pictures to what we saw in the patients, that the, the ProC6 levels are dose dependently reduced um, by this compound. So this really showcases how these markers may also be used in a translational way from the very early um, stages of, of drug development and on to the clinical stage. Last year, um, we also published this paper together with, uh, with BMS. This investigated their LPA1 antagonist in a phase two study of, of IPF. And I found this super interesting because we're looking at a broad panel of biomarkers. So both evaluating the effects on the interstitial matrix, on the basement membrane, and also on inflammation. And overall, we see that the, uh, the compound here has a beneficial effect on these biomarkers. It reduces the levels of these biomarkers compared to placebo, shown in blue. Um, and the reductions are already seen after four weeks and keeps down um, at the 26 weeks time point. So some of the very new data um, we have seen with, with the novel drugs in the IPF space uh, and these biomarkers is from the, the plan group. This is um, data that came out uh, early this year <clears throat> um, from their phase two trial. And here they looked at the pro free biomarkers, so type, C, type 3 collagen formation, and they saw dose-dependent reductions already after four weeks of treatment. And when they then looked at the proportion of uh, lung function uh, decliners shown here on the right, we actually see that this fits quite nicely with what we, we see with the pro -C free levels in blood, that the highest, um, highest dose of, of the compound here has 0% uh, uh, of, of decliners. And this is also the, um, the dose that gives the highest reduction in pro -C free So I find these data super interesting that we're actually able to sort of mirror what happens in the patients with these uh, blood biomarkers. So I will just, uh, in, in this part, also go back to, to the standard of care treatments, because we know, of course, that IPF patients are being treated um, with antifibrotics at the moment. These are not the, the perfect drugs. They are not halting the disease, but this is what we have at the moment, and they are doing some good, of course, in, in the patients. So we, we went back to some of the IPF cohorts that we've been working with that included uh, standard of care and evaluated um, how the biomarker moved over time. So, of course, this is a real-world study, so it's not control for the treatment. So this is more of a, a hint of what's going on. And, and we try to evaluate what these um, treatments may be doing to, to the changes in the lung. So here I go back to the bimentin biomarkers, uh, the one for macrophage activity and the one for bimentin degradation. When we divide the patients into the different treatment arms, the patients with no treatment shown in gray, um, we see that the Vicam biomarker, the macrophage activity biomarker, seems to be reduced in the patients that are actually on treatment. So I think this is interesting that it's again the Vicam marker and not the Vim marker that seems to be responding um, in this case to treatment. One of our very new biomarkers um, is the CTX3. This is a marker of fibrosis resolution, measuring a fragment from type 3 collagen. And we did this um, early evaluation in the same IPF cohort, the real world study. So there is a lot of variation going on here, but it shows some really interesting trends um, looking at, this, at these data here. Again, we have the no treatment shown in gray, and we see that the CTX3 biomarker actually increases when we have active treatment in the patients. So it increases up to 30% in these patients. So it indicates that this marker is actually measuring the fibrosis resolution that goes on in these patients. We know already that this biomarker is performing really well in the setting of liver fibrosis. So of course, we want to explore it much more in, in the setting of lung fibrosis. And we do believe it's a, it's a marker to um, to be used to better understand what, what goes on and how the antifibrotic drugs work uh, in these patients. So lastly, I will just um, show this data that was shown uh, earlier this year on, on ERS by our collaborator from Anche Prasis group. Um, this is again showing on the left side here how the survival looks in patients with increasing or 
or decreasing of stable levels of the CRPM inflammation biomarker. But what's even more interesting here is that if we then split the patients up by treatment, we actually see that this significant difference is only seen in the patients that are receiving nintendinib and not in the ones that receive perfenidone. So this really is intriguing. Uh, it seems like something different goes on in these two patients group, patient groups, and potentially we could use a biomarker such as this to monitor the response to, to nintendinib. So in this very last part, um, I will talk a bit about endotype. Skeasley already mentioned this a bit, but I will talk about a smaller study that we did um, in our group with a collaborator from, from Aarhus University. Um, we measured 10 different biomarkers at baseline in these patients, around 100 IPF patients, and we identified three different clusters only based on the biomarkers. So these biomarkers include the different types of matrix markers and, and inflammation biomarkers. And when we looked at these three different clusters and how they behaved, um, we see here on the left that the, the, the um, cluster that had high levels of biomarkers were actually the ones that had more steep uh, lung function decline. And the cluster that had low levels of biomarkers were the ones that were doing best. On the right side here, I just plotted the, the biomarkers that were significantly elevated in the high, um, high cluster group uh, shown in red. So this includes, for example, the pro 4 marker of basement membrane and also the L3 um, of the elastin and neutrophil elastase, uh, neutrophil um, activity biomarker. So looking at these data, of course, we could assume that the three different clusters that we identified were different from the beginning. So, of course, we looked at the, at the clinical char characteristics of these three different clusters, and what we found was actually that they were very, very similar. Um, so this was super surprising to us that they, they were similar from the beginning. They had a similar age, similar smoking status, a similar um, a, a time since their diagnosis, and similar lung function. So we couldn't really use any of these parameters to differentiate the patients. So this means that these endotypes are actually based only on the findings in with the biomarkers at baseline. So we could identify these unique endotypes just using the, the biomarkers of tissue changes. And this was in the setting of, of IPF, but this is also something that we are doing uh, currently for COPD. Um, we have an ongoing project where we look into to COPD patients. We have a study from the samples from the Eclipse study with more than 2,000 patients. And we want to evaluate and identify new uh, endotypes in this study. So our aim is to, to combine the clinical char characteristics that we have for these patients with biomarkers of ECM remodeling, inflammation, the, the, the biomarkers that are really relevant for the processes that these patients are, are having. And hopefully by that, we can identify novel endotypes that can be treated in, in different ways so we can enable precision medicine. At least that's the hope. So we really hope to be able to, to do some of this work and help patients to get the right treatment. And with this, I will go to the, the summary. Um, so biomarkers and fragments of ECM remodeling and inflammation, they reflect relevant disease processes. They are associated with disease progression and death. They can respond to treatment. Um, and this is both in the setting of patients and also in different model systems, meaning that they can be used as translational tools. And lastly, they may be able to identify prognostic endotypes. So with this, I would like to, to thank all our great collaborators and also my colleagues at Nordic Bioscience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yeni. All right, now I would like to invite all speakers back to the stage for our Q&A session. Um, we've received a couple of nice questions and that we, have can, that we hope we can answer with your uh, expertise. Um, and for the audience, if you have any more questions, please drop them in the chat box and, and we can address them here. 
All right. Um, so to kick off uh, the discussion, uh, Jeanette, the difference uh, in behavior of non-fibrotic fibroblasts versus fibrotic fibroblasts uh, based on the ECM stiffness is interesting. How does this relate to the physiological setting? Does this mean that based on the exist existing tissue uh, stiffness, the fibroblasts contribute uh, to exacerbating the fibros fibrosis process? That's what the data is appearing to tell us. So the, the stiffnesses that we're working with in the fibrotic hydrogels are very similar to the stiffnesses um, that we see in fibrotic lung tissue. So the fact that the fibroblasts are stimulated by this fibrotic matrix to deposit more fibrotic proteins and also produce other factors that influence, so lysyl oxidases that then cross-link that matrix, does suggest that there's a feed-forward loop. Once you've established that fibrosis, it just becomes exaggerated. Mayor, can I ask a question to Gisli? Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> because I got a little worried during Gisli's talk. Um, oh. As you said, the dogs were like a brick, and dogs were like a brick, and, and they are... <laughs> They were so dense, I know that. But I got to be thinking, are there still blood vessels in those areas? Are we actually able to remove some of that interstitial matrix and put back the basement membrane? I mean, can you can you talk about if there are any insights into are we at all able to regenerate something? And and how do how do I remove the bad ECM and put in the good ECM? Yeah, so that's a, that's the holy grail, Morton. So as I'd like to say that we, we know the strategy to cure fibrosis. It's really very easy. You've just got to dissolve the matrix, rebuild the basement membrane, and then pop a few normal epithelial cells back, and Bob's your uncle. Um, the, the, each one of those steps is a gazillion research uh, projects on its own so how how are we going to dissolve the matrix so that's the first thing how are we going to dissolve the matrix and not destroy everything else around it, it, it that's a real challenge um it's we we can we know for example that you can regenerate the liver when even when it's really fibrotic we know that fibrosis can occur depending on the nature of the matrix very, you know, in, in things like pneumonia, for example, post pneumonia, acute lung injury, you get a lot of matrix deposition, but it will resolve. So I think we, with a greater understanding of the dynamics of, of matrix, and so work that you guys and, and Jeanette do is, is fundamental to understanding how we can turn that matrix over and then target that through, you know, lysolox days, light molecules, transcriptaminases, MMPs, all of these things may be appropriate targets. And then we've got to reconstitute the basement membrane. So understanding the basement membrane is crucial. So work that, you know, me and you are doing on collagen 4, for example, I think will be highly informative. I think the emerging data showing that you know, collagen 4 is a real Goldilocks molecule. If you have too much, it's bad. If you have not enough, it's bad. You know, you need just the right amount. Uh, and then we've got to figure out a way of, of turning those aberrant epithelial cells into normal epithelial cells. And when we've got all that licked, we can go to the pub and congratulate ourselves. <laughs> that was a complicated answer, but I had expected that. Mayor, can I am I allowed one more because I've I've been rehearsing for a, an <laughs> evil question for Janet. So let's go ahead. So, yeah. so in 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 making the new collagen book, I wanted to have a really nice collagen chaperone uh, chapter. I mean, what is the collagen machinery making collagens? And and in your talk, you're also talking about how how collagens are made and how collagen are stabilized. But, but I think when we are talking about antifibrotic therapies and targeting fibrosis, we obviously need to talk, target the fibrillar collagens and not the basement membrane collagen. We cannot just stop all collagen production. And so in, 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 in researching for the book, I could not find differences in the machinery making a fibrillar collagen and a non-fibrillar collagen. Do you have insights into 
what what are the differences in making those and that we can learn from and how to manipulate those two matrices separately i can't wait for that answer <laughs> Uh, so what I'm going to tell you is speculation, Morton, because I don't have insights into all of the dynamics. I mean, the processes that I'm looking at are happening outside of the cell. So I yeah. think the processes inside the cell are quite similar for the production of the units for fibrillar collagen and non-fibrillar collagen. But it's once they come outside the cell and we have these chaperone proteins that are then orchestrating how those proteins are assembled, that's where we're seeing the differences. And I think we need to have a greater understanding of which proteins are supporting which. So I think the, the basement membrane proteins are supported by a very defined set of proteoglycans. So things like aglycan and nitrogen, whereas mm. the fibrillar collagens are supported by decorin, mm. by periostin, by the fibulin family. So if we can understand the dynamics of these chaperone matricine proteins and how they're then arranging the assembly, of the major fibrillar collagens, then we can start really getting into that process. That was a well-balanced answer. Thanks, Jen. I appreciate that. Mayu, I'm sure that you have some good questions from the chat. Then I, if not, then I will rehearse more evil questions. <laughs> no, of course. Um, so, uh, Jeanette, uh, have you looked at what crosslinks might be preserved in the fibrotic matrices after it is reconstituted? That's a great question, Mayor, and it's something that we're actually looking at at the moment. So we're working with a, a collaborative partner who have samples at the moment where they're measuring crosslinks in our um, hydrogels and in the scaffolds uh, from the decellularized materials. So uh, hopefully in a couple of months, I'll be able to answer that question for you. Thank you. And then a question for the whole panel. Um, what do you think uh, the new investigations into ILAs, so uh, interstitial lung abnormalities, will impact our ILD research. Please go ahead. Uh, Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. There. I was going <laughs> to. It's going to say. I think so. The reality is, as you know, if we think about it for more than two minutes is that you clearly go if it, you go from normal lung to 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 fibrosis along a pathway and it doesn't happen overnight most usually i mean in very rare cases do you get rapidly progressive fibrosis but you know there's a fairly long prodromal subclinical pathway of which you, you develop ilas there are a lot more ILAs than there are patients with end-stage fibrosis. So the challenge is going to be identifying those patients with ILAs who are going to go on to become fibrotic and to intervene at a time before they become symptomatic and become, uh, you know, re requiring pretty toxic therapies. And biomarkers are going to be fundamental in that. So I think you know, developing biomarkers which will help us understand which patients with ILAs are going to go on and get disease that needs treatment, especially if you can identify treatment which works early. So that has to be, you know, and this is, I mean, these are sort of fundamental principles. I'm not talking about any particular drug here, but, you know, these drugs will have to be cheap. They'll have to be safe, you know, with long-term tox you know, availability, because people are going to be taking them for a long, long time. And they're going to have to have a very tolerable side effect profile. Uh, and so once we've identified drugs which can impact the matrix, which have those, you know, that's tough because, you know, we're, we're really looking at repurposed medications here, you know, because you know, the, there's no, there's, the, it's, it's going to be virtually impossible to find a cheap, uh, drug with long-term tox available. I mean, it just doesn't, you know, so it's, we're going to have to be thinking repurposed unless some pharmacological company are very generous. Uh, um, so I think biomarkers are going to be crucial in that, in, in that process. Yes. So I'm Go ahead, Janet. Well, I was going to say, I would see this as an opportunity for, um, 
the markers that Yanni's been telling us about that give us an indication of ECM turnover and processes that are happening in the lungs. And I would be intrigued to see whether we had, can detect an early signal of that process in these, these patients that are showing up with ILAs um, well before we see changes in lung function. Because yeah. then we have an opportunity to start understanding what is the process that's happening very early to then be thinking about these targets that Gisley wants us to find drugs for. Yeah, I, I of course agree that these prognostic biomarkers will be super relevant at this point. I think the hard part, of course, will be or one of the hard parts will be to find the patients so early and actually have the studies and the available studies and, and, and um, possibilities to look into these and identify the changes so early because how do you identify the patients before they are patients, right? And then we need to follow them for a long time, be time before they do develop into fibrotic patients. So I think, Jenny, that actually the, the first part of your question is relatively straightforward. We, you know, lung cancer screening of at-risk patients is everywhere now. So there are, the, the challenge is not finding the patients, it's having the patients to, to, to invest uh, in something which is, 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 as you say, is a long-term goal. So there are hundreds of thousands of patients you can study but have you got the funds or the or, or the patients, not the patients, uh, to 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 wait twenty years for a return on your investment as a biomarker company, which is the reality? May I may I ask a, a question here? I, I'm going to have to ask you to wait one more question <laughs> because we have some quite some nice questions here from the audience that I would really like to address. So uh, a follow-up question on how to fix the mess that is the alveolar neighborhood in IPF. Oh. Does uh, epigenetics have something to do with how the different cell types seem to align from being in homeostasis to going all in on enabling the fibrotic ECM deposition phenotype? Uh, I'm assuming that's a question to me. It's a great question. I think, yeah, do epigenetics play a role? Absolutely. What role does it play? I don't know. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a complicated area, which I haven't as yet fully figured out. But clearly, that's all part of this process. You know, how do we fix that mess? We don't know. I mean, I think whatever causes these type 2 cells to get stuck in transition, being able to, the challenge is not going to be to get rid of them or to 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 do something to them, but it's to to repair them so that they no longer get stuck in transition. And yeah. understanding epigenetics is going to be a key part of that. It's not the it's not the part that I'm studying, but I you know other people should definitely study that because it's going to be a fundamental part trying to trying to get those abnormal, if you can get those abnormal transitional cells to become normal again, that's a major part of the battle. Thank you. Uh, one more question from Jeanette. Is fibula 1-1 also a potential good marker of fibrosis in other organs, such as the intestines? Uh, I haven't seen any data in the intestines, but it's definitely been um, shown in uh, liver fibrosis and kidney fibrosis to also play a role in those uh, disease processes. Okay, Martin, go ahead. <laughs> well, at, at the extracellular metric pharmacology, we are bringing in organs from, so liver, kidney, skin, all organs, because I think we need to learn from each other. And so, so Geasley, do you think you could learn something from an organ that actually do know how to regenerate? I one hundred percent. I think um, I think understanding why some organs have much greater regenerative repair than others is is clearly uh, a, a useful thing. And I learn a huge amount by you know, going to things like Keystone conferences, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where we, we we talk about multi-organ fibrosis a lot. And as part of the demystify uh, consortium that I'm running, we're we're looking very much at understanding kidney fibrosis, renal fibrosis, sorry, liver fibrosis, renal fibrosis, pancreatic fibrosis, diabetes, and the endothelium and hypertension. I mean, we forget the endothelium 
in IPF quite a lot, and hypertension is the commonest comorbidity in uh, in IPF. So, I think thinking about fibrosis and other organs is going to be crucial. It's because Yanni said something important in her talk. She said that the biomarker profile of IPF is actually different than other fibrotic diseases, and we see that that the the profile of a of a fibrotic organ that regenerates is different as compared to one that does not regenerate. I can see that the collagens are different, but I need some help in figuring out what it means. So in my team, we're actually playing with uh, matrices from different organs as well. Um, and so I collaborate with people who work in skin and who work in the, the um, vascular system. And so they have hydrogels from skin and from the aorta. Um, and we see different characteristics in these different hydrogels. And we've actually played with mixing ECM powders from skin and from lung. And instead of seeing a sort of synergistic uh, combination, we see a completely different response okay. to skin alone, lung alone, and then yeah. this hybrid. Um, so the nature of the matrix and the molecules that are there are very um, important in driving what the cells are, uh, how they're responding. And also, if you mix cell types in there, you also see different responses. So this is where understanding the, the crosstalk between different cell types in a matrix environment is going to be equally important for understanding these disease processes. I think we need to go back to some of Mina Bissell's old, old work. She showed us that the matrix conferred the response to cells and showed us that the matrix could control the breast cancer epithelial cells and and I think there are some clues in, in some of her work on, on how to understand the patient membrane. I, I agree. And I think actually I'm very excited about your collagen 6 data because that it seems to be a double whammy. You know, it is ah. it's bad in all lungs, but it's also directly, so it's not just a marker, it's also directly fibrogenic. And so you have this catastrophic situation whereby if you stimulate fibrosis in one organ and you've got all this stuff sloshing about in the blood which is now pro-fibrogenic you can see how we can end up promoting fibrosis uh, in organ after organ and once you get lung fibrosis because i think <coughs> largely the <coughs> pardon me the lung is so, so much more delicate than other organs and any structural change has a much greater consequence. Uh, it's often the final common pathway in fibrotic diseases, unfortunately. Yeah, good point. Question for Yeni. Are neutrophils and, and macrophages the only source of degradation fragments and then how selective is the downstream matrix degradation indicative of immune cell activity? <laughs> Yeah, so that's a, a super good question. Um, so of course there are some of the some common proteases from different immune cells. So they are not very very specific. Um, but that being said, we we do know that the citrullination, for example, in the dimentin comes out of the active macrophages. So we generally see that they are related to the macrophages. Of course, the, there is something in addition to that. It's not it's not specific specific, but it is more from that cell, so to say. Um, that was not a, a very clear answer, but I think it's it's, uh, it's hard to be super specific in these cases because the biology is so so complex. We, of course, also know that the collagens are not tissue specific. We are talking about the lungs today, but they're also coming from other organs, of course. So there will always be some kind of background coming from other, other cells or other organs. Great. Thank you. Uh, one last question then, since we're running over time now. Um, is ACAP-13 a potential drug target and how far is it, if it is, how, do you know how far it is in the development to the clinic? So uh, so is, is ACAP-13 a drug target? I think it is. I, I think it's a challenge um, because it's such a big molecule. So will 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 it be targetable by any? And it's an intracellular molecule. I think it's it's possible. The compound that we used had to be given at high concentration. Um, that doesn't mean it's not druggable. Um, certainly, if it 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 brings together two of the most 
promising pathways, i.e. PD4 and uh, PD6 integrins uh, through row A, and, and also row A itself is a, a promising target. So actually three of the still standing molecular pathways in, in, that are being targeted, it brings them together. So I'd have thought uh, it would be a great target if you could have the medicinal chemistry to, to inhibit it, and you might want to inhibit one, both, or all of it. I mean, as I said, it's big. It's big, big molecules. So I think there are challenges. Um, but yeah, I think, and, and also you can, the minor allele frequency is pretty high, and it's about 35%. Uh, so the, there's a lot of there's a lot of people with it, but you could certainly enrich your IPF population quite nicely by by if you targeted that. Perfect. Thank you. All right, then I would like to thank the speakers for their invaluable insights, and, and would like to thank the audience for joining our sessions. Uh, I hope we expanded your knowledge on the exosomal matrix in, in lung diseases. And we hope you will attend the next session, which will focus on uh, dermatology diseases. Um, so thanks again, and uh, have a wonderful day, morning, evening, or night, wherever you are in the world. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody.